Good afternoon. My name is Raheem Thompson. I'm the manager of public programs. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, and the entire museum, I would like to thank you all for joining us for this afternoon's Lunch and Learn opposite Mandela with Tony Leon. Tony Leon was a prominent figurehead during the most turbulent and exciting times in contemporary South African politics. He is the longest serving leader of the official opposition in the parliament of South Africa. His political leadership coincided with the presidency of Nelson Mandela. Mandela said of Leon at the time, he is a leader whose dynamicism and capacity for analysis keeps everyone on their toes. And when Leon stepped down, Mandela acknowledged that Tony's contribution to their democracy was enormous. In this Lunch and Learn, Tony will use a PowerPoint presentation to tell his story and share key lessons from his work with Mandela and other anti-apartheid leaders and share his perspective on why the miracle that brought about democracy in South Africa is due for a renewal. Before we begin the program, I would like to thank all of our community partners and supporters in, in putting this program together. And now I pass things off to Tony, who will start a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Tony. Good afternoon, Raheem. And thank you very much indeed, everyone, uh, for being uh, with us today. And really, the power of uh, technology in these COVID times means we can communicate across the world, as I'm doing right now. One of the advantages, if there's one in the situation, is indeed the in ability that we have to reach across the normal divisions of distance and physical separation. I also reflect on the fact that the man we honor in this timeless exhibition on Mandela the struggle for freedom, uh, which has been curated so well by the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, was himself born on the 18th of July, 1918, while the First World War was raging and the telegraph and the telephone were only then very recent inventions. Allow me at the outset to sincerely thank the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center for curating this fine exhibition on the life and times of South Africa's global icon in such an exemplary fashion. The museum has given real meaning in my view to the second half of its title as an education center, as we will find the power of Mandela's example rather than the reverse true meaning for leadership and conflict resolution across the world. On a personal note, allow me to thank Rahim for uh, curating today's talk with such exemplary professionalism and indeed the generosity of my old friend from Durban, South Africa, now resident in the United States, Mark Hackner and the Hackner family for their generous contribution to this exhibition. The Mill Park Hospital in uh, Johannesburg in the suburb of Parktown West is an unusual place in which the president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela in December, 1998, met one of his political opponents. Let me explain that at the time, I was leader of the then small democratic party in parliament, a liberal political formation, which had been represented for many years alone in parliament by Helen Sussman, another icon of the anti-apartheid struggle who had provided Mandela and his fellow prisoners much support during his 27 years incarceration in prison. But Mandela, and my party were political opponents of each other, since the more nationalistic and socialistic ANC was somewhat at odds with the uh, liberal and free market approach of the Democratic Party, which I then led. Fate, a bad genetic inheritance and some dissolute habits had found me in one of the private wards of this hospital in Parktown and Johannesburg, about to undergo a coronary bypass operation my cardiologist assured me back in December 1998 that any further delay in the operation would mean that my imminent 42nd birthday would be the last that I celebrate. But I had not allowed the timing of that operation to interfere with a hectic political schedule. And so just before arriving in hospital, I'd undertaken a fairly grueling tour of the major cities of South Africa, 
featuring showbiz style rallies in for the Democratic Party, which I've been leading since 1994, build the leader of the opposition tour. I need to also say this was something of a stretch, since at that time, my party only had seven seats out of 400 in Parliament, and we had 70 fewer than the major opposition party, which was the National Party of F.W. de Klerk and his successors. However, my party in the preceding four years had made the running in the polls on the opposition side, and we were well positioned in the election, which came the following year, to actually become the principal number two party in South Africa. And my political uh, strategists had decided that we need to make the claim for ourselves to be the official opposition party before the election, hence the leader of the opposition tour with Reyes Mepetaz and a suitable amount of chutzpah. Fortunately, the next election results would prove our matter to be correct, and we increased our voting tally sixfold, and it confirmed us as the principal number two party or opposition in South Africa. It was during one of those city hall rallies, just before my operation, that in my rather customary blunt style, I had lashed out at the ANC cabinet, then presided over by President Nelson Mandela for one or other of its lapses of governance. This particular attack had clearly, clearly got the president's goat. And a day or two afterward, he ridiculed my party as being a Mickey Mouse organization. At the next rally, a newspaper reporter asked me my response to the president's attack. Stumped for a meaningful rejoinder, I decided to repay Mandela with coins from the same Walt Disney currency. And I said, well, if I'm the head of a Mickey Mouse party, all I can say is that Mandela must lead a goofy government. I thought very little for further of this offhand and doubtless kindergarten response, but it clearly delighted the headline writers of the Johannesburg newspaper, The Citizen. And the day after my rejoinder, the newspaper emblazoned across its front page, Leon attacks Mandela's goofy government. But the night before my major heart surgery, both the remark and the target were the furthest things from my why in mind as I lay in bed anxiously awaiting my fate in the company of my Israeli girlfriend and soon-to-be wife, Michal. At around 5 p.m. on this afternoon, there was a knock on my hospital door. A world-famous but yet now familiar voice called out from the other side of the door. Hello, Mickey Mouse. This is Goofy. Can I come in? And in strode Nelson Mandela. He entered the room alone, beaming, a smile, and radiating his customary charm. He wished me well for the next day's procedure, chatted for a few moments, and then left. It was a very good augury for the operation, which was successfully concluded. But in that now fading snapshot from memory, this visit characterized the essence of Mandela and the relationship which he forged with the political figures of his time and a throng of humanity beyond the confines of government and party politics. My perspective of Mandela provides a very different vantage point from many others, from the parliamentary opposition side, which I led during his presidency, to which he was both close and of course, very distant. Throughout the Mandela presidency, however, from 1994 to 1999, my small party was in direct contrast to the enormous behemoth which he bestrode. In 1994, I was concerned with re-establishing the relevance of my party after a crushing electoral defeat. Mandela, by contrast, had to concern himself with binding the wounds of a very divided nation. He had to keep together or bring together its physiparous communities. And almost until the day he was inaugurated as president of South Africa, the first democratic president, as you see from the slide, the country itself had been in a state of conflict, if not war with itself and with each other, much of it obviously violent. That South Africa stood much taller after his storied five-year presidency, so much more at peace with the world and indeed with itself, and had managed to grow and tap into 
democratic and constitutional roots on the very fragile soil of its stony and conflicted past owes a great deal to just one man. I've always wrestled in relation to my encounters with Mandela and other political leaders I've met personally or I've viewed through the lens of history with the fundamental difficulty of separating the power of human agency on the one hand and what Karl Marx termed the motive forces of history on the other, or to put it another way, the confluence of events and the formations which propelled the individuals who led their countries. Undoubtedly, while Mandela was at all times the servant and the political symbol of the movement he came to lead, he was also at key moments the person who provided personal leadership, which proved quite decisive in determining the course of his country. Of the personal, Mark Twain once reminded us that every man is a moon with a dark side which he does not show anyone. We can also bracket Mandela with the Mahatma Gandhi as one of the very select few of any era who transcend the politics of their age and rank in that rare category of the truly good and the great. But on this note, we should also bear in mind George Orwell's necessary caution and apply it to both of them. He said, the problem with conferring sainthood on Gandhi is that you need to rescue saints under a pile of tissues and saccharine, or from under a pile of tissues and saccharine. Indeed, Mandela at times displayed blind spots, sometimes intemperate outbursts, which occluded his otherwise hopeful vision and positive outlook for the country and for a multiracial South Africa. It's also true, and perhaps should be emphasized, that some of the worst mistakes that have happened since Mandela started to show themselves or their tendencies while Mandela was still very much alive and well and leading the country. But once again, this only paints Mandela as a human and not as some kind of deity, which some of his more wrong-headed and gushing admirers have chosen to canonize him as. But from the perspective of 2021, I still believe, perhaps more emphatically today than at the time of its utterance in Parliament, that my tribute when Parliament gathered to bid farewell to him when he was standing down as president in March 1999 remains true. I said on that occasion before Parliament and indeed in front of Mandela, I am deeply honored that I've been able to see from these benches the ending of apartheid and the beginning of democracy under the presidency of Nelson Mandela. My respect and admiration for him is unconditional. He graces this house, he graces this country, he graces humanity. On a more personal note, when I stood down from the political leadership myself in 2008, I wrote an autobiography on the contrary, and I've liberally consulted it for this talk this afternoon. But I wrote then, and I think actually the intervening uh, 13 years since its publication has amply justified my conclusion that Mandela was an extraordinary phenomenon. At one level, he was all too human, but at another level, he inhabited a plane out of reach of most mortal politicians. Incidentally, I place myself very much in the latter category. Certainly from the proximity angle, the Mandela presidency was an all-inclusive effort which operated on many fronts. He led a government of national unity, which until 1996 had as its second component the party he just defeated in the polls, the National Party of F.W. de Klerk. But when de Klerk decided to leave the government of national unity in 1996 in an attempt to strike out as an independent opposition party, Mandela approached me and suggested that I joined the government of national unity. This was a very, very difficult, tempting proposition because on the one hand, it would have taken my small party and put it into the seat of power. On the other hand, Mandela made it quite clear that once we were in the government, we wouldn't be able to criticize it outside. And therefore it became clear to me that if we accept his offer, tempting it was and generous though it was in the making of it, we would have closed down the concept of independent opposition in the country. Incidentally, Mandela offered me this tempting bauble personally 
at a breakfast he asked me to attend at his home in Johannesburg at the unearthly hour of 6 a.m. But Mandela, after over two and a half decades of prison, was an early riser. And that was his preferred time, as he put it to me once, for thinking and talking over big matters. My clock worked in the opposite direction, and I was somewhat frazzled to be in the president's company with such a daunting proposal so early in the day. When I advised him at subsequent meetings about the same proposal that we could not accept his generous offer, it did not alter by one jot our personal relationship or indeed his political perspective. And that perhaps tells you something else about Nelson Mandela. Because throughout the Mandela presidency and for some years before it, I was often at the receiving end of what the ghostwriter of his autobiography and latterly the editor of Time magazine, Richard Stengel, called the full Mandela. And although uh, Stengel himself was primarily responsible for writing Mandela's famed book, Long Walk to Freedom, he indeed enjoyed many hours alone with Nelson Mandela. And he said of him, he is a power charmer, confident that he will charm you by whatever means possible. He is attentive, courtly, winning, and to use a word he would hate, seductive. The charm is political as well as personal, and he regards himself so much, not so much as the great communicator, but as the great persuader. He would always rather persuade you to do something than order you to do it, but he will always stand up for what he believes is right with a stubbornness that is virtually unbending. Now, I have personal testimony to the correctness of Stengel's observation, and I tell many of my parliamentary colleagues after another session of the great man and a dose of what I used to call the full Mandela, that from an opposition perspective, it was a little bit like the movie Fatal Attraction. You were drawn in, but you had to sometimes keep your guard up. And Stengel provided another clue on what the Mandela uh, charm offensive was about. He wrote that his charm was an inverse proportion, I'm sorry, to how well he knows you. He is warm with strangers and cool with intimates. That benign smile is bestowed on every new person who comes within his orbit, but the smile is reserved for outsiders. Now Mandela had famously a very special relationship with a vast array of people, from the good and the well-known to the humble and the obscure. In the former category fell uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who once said of her own self-described Annus Horribilis, that distance lends enchantment. She was describing the year 1992 when marital scandals afflicted two of her sons and her home at Windsor Castle caught fire. In contrast, since Mandela was present at the same time as Queen Elizabeth uh, was making those remarks, and indeed here she is with her late husband, Prince Philip, at the quayside in Cape Town after arriving for a royal tour in 1995, you might say that Mandela's years as president were a national and personal annus mirabilis, or years of wonder. Viewed again from the contrast of today, it could be said that his country, which is my own country, in the wake of weak leadership, corruption scandals, misgovernance, and now deeply frayed communal relations, suffers from its own annus horribilis, or indeed a succession of them. But I think a caution is in order here to put Mandela in the perspective of his times. His great personal characteristics aside, Mandela's presidency had the advantage of occurring at a time of national and international transcending change. He was the bookend between the dying of the old order and the dawn of a new age. By the time he took office, the 76 years of communist rule over Eastern Europe had ended with the destruction of the Berlin Wall. And 46 years of apartheid rule and three centuries plus of racial domination in South Africa had come to an end. It was, in other words, an era of new and brave and even dramatic beginnings. It was on his watch that Mandela was able to help negotiate and indeed ink the, the new constitution. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, chaired by his close friend and arguably the second greatest South African of his age, Desmond Tutu, 
commenced and concluded its work, and the country and its first citizen basked in the attention and admiration of the world. Such an alignment of stars is very rare in any country's history. And sometimes it is easier to guide the ship of state through the high seas of big events than it is to navigate through the smaller but often unseen and therefore more treacherous currents which had fell to his successors to help maneuver. But some gaffes and missteps aside, Mandela led by example in opening up the free space necessary for a democracy to take root in our country. And I'm going to also conclude this lecture with some further thoughts on that very important aspect. It was the rare combination of personal history and the enforced 27 year period of imprisonment, which led to reflection and introspection, which perhaps uniquely qualified Mandela for the task of being the country's cheerleader, cheerleader in chief for democratic freedoms. When Mandela was gravely ill in hospital in August, 2013, his close confidant, Palo Jordan, reminded us that during the Ravonia trial, in which Mandela defended himself against high treason charges, which could have resulted in his execution, Mandela cited the Magna Carta, the Petition of Rights, and the United States Bill of Rights as expressions of his vision for a free society in South Africa. No less than his own movement's Freedom Charter, these international testaments of freedom clearly informed and helped shape his worldview and his tone of governance. But Mandela's rich and complex background helped inform and shape the powerful and symbolic gestures which so marked his presidency and defined his leadership style. And this too brings in the question of the personal biography as a template for presidential authority. The British statesman, Lord Dennis Healy, once said properly rounded leaders need a hinterland of life and philosophy beyond the narrow confines of the party dictat. Few of any country's rulers, and certainly none here since his presidency, have enjoyed Mandela's breadth of experiences. Although this lecture makes no claim to being a full or even partial biography of the man, the encounters I had with him and the events of his later years which I witnessed were testimony to his extraordinary roundness as both a person and as a politician. Richard Stengel again captures the complex and myriad and even contradictory forces which shaped his life and informed his politics. His persona is a mixture of African royalty and British aristocracy. He is a ge Victorian gentleman in a silk dashiki. Politics and imprisonment might have uh, explained his life, but so too was his decision to escape an early arranged marriage, to commence the first black practice, law practice in Johannesburg with his close confidant and party leader, Oliver Tamber, pictured here, and to make a living independently of any assigned roles for him in downtown Johannesburg. He was more certifiable member of the human race than a narrowly formed political partisan. And indeed it was on Robben Island, that fearsome place, which was the center of his imprisonment for nearly 27 years, that he said, I, it allowed me time to think and time to reflect. So nothing in Mandela's life was wasted. Every experience morphed into a future decision-making pattern, which became apparent when it was practiced. And doubtless it was this rich personal hinterland which allowed him to call the Queen of England by her first name and to win equally the adulation of his, the peasants in his own home province of the Eastern Cape. It also informed some of his most powerful gestures and symbols. Incidentally, when the Queen, or Elizabeth as Mandela called her, visited South Africa in 1995 with the late Prince Philip, Mandela introduced me to her at a small reception before a dinner at the Cape Sun Hotel in Cape Town by advising her, and I quote, this young man is the one who gives me all my trouble in parliament, and he laughed heartily. Her Majesty did not respond at all beyond extending her gloved hand for me to shake. So what British royalty made of this intro, I have absolutely no idea. Today, by contrast, almost our entire political leadership 
is drawn from the ranks of lifetime politicians and trade unions. And this, of course, is not confined to the governing party in South Africa. Many emerging leaders on the opposition side as well have had no career outside party politics. And this is reflected across the world, perhaps. The historian Paul Johnson described the rise of the professional politician as the scourge of the 20th century. On the other hand, in the 21st century, in 2016 to be precise, the United States elected an avowed non-professional politician as president, and we are still absorbing the consequences of that five years later. Gestures and symbols are hugely important and very often underestimated in statecraft. And Mandela had an almost genius-like ability to use them to shape his nation and bind its component parts together, as I'll reflect in a moment. And you know, he set the benchmark uh, for what his office would become even before entering it. On the eve of South Africa's 1994 election, the only television debate between two political principles was between Mandela and F.W. de Klerk. In the main, it was a rancorous and a point scoring exercise with Mandela spending much of it on the offensive. Yet toward the conclusion, Mandela reached across to de Klerk and took his hand and said of his main rival, I am proud to hold your hand. Let us work together to end division and suspicion. You know, posterity today remembers that gesture far better than the debate long forgotten. And in that gesture, what became to be known as the Rainbow Nation was born. I should also note, because I think it's very important, often not emphasized, there was not simply the largeness of vision of Nelson Mandela and his heroic background, which enabled South Africa against the odds and despite 350 years of conquest, division and violence to transition from apartheid to democracy on the stony soil of my land. It also owes a debt of gratitude, and I think over time history might reflect this, to the other partner in that uh, transition, F.W. de Klerk. Mandela and de Klerk had a very difficult and often very tempestuous relationship. And I had a much easier relationship with both of them. But of course, de Klerk served for two years unhappily as Mandela's constitutional deputy president as a consequence of one of the many crucial compromises arrived at in South Africa in 1993 before the heralding of the new democratic age. So what I'm trying to do by emphasizing this is to suggest that any template for other transitions, it's important to realize that the rarity of a Mandela type figure to emerge and to lead the liberators needs to find its match on the other side of the divides of history. Because it was at the time of Mandela's release from prison ordered by de Klerk in 1990, that de Klerk as then president held all the reins of formal power, including the police, the army, and indeed a very powerful state. He set the timetable for his own removal from power, although not on terms or in a manner which he anticipated. Two American historians, Daniel Byman and Kenneth M. Pollock, looked at this aspect fairly recently in a 2019 article in Foreign Affairs magazine and concluded, and I quote from it, if de Klerk had remained committed to apartheid, the most likely outcome would have been South Africa's descent into an even greater level of racial violence and quite possibly an all out civil war, not much different from what is happening in Syria and Venezuela today. It was in my view, the rare and great fortune for South Africa that there was both a Mandela and a de Klerk center stage, excuse me, at critical moments of its transition. Now, paradoxically, the most partisan of politicians was Mandela. Indeed, it was he who said shortly before he died in 2013, when I go to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do is join the ANC branch up there. He was also, and here's the riddle, able to look beyond the interests of the party and make tough calls to meet the needs of the country in the making. You see, there was another critical moment just before the 1994 elections, which are commemorate today with a sense of wonder, South Africa's Freedom Day, where people across the land, the enfranchised, the disenfranchised, the rich, the poor, the white, black, 
queued up peacefully to make their mark for change. And all that is true up to a point, but only up to a point. Because while we look at those events through the tinge glasses of nostalgia, for those of us who were involved in that poll, and for others who can remember the detail, it was a far more jagged affair, often very touch and go. There were unreconciled ballots. There were pirate voting stations. There were jarring irregularities and there was a deep sense of violence. There were bombs exploding on the day of the polls in central Johannesburg and at its international airport. And there was a breakdown in the counting of votes and the country waited and waited and waited for the final results. Now, the ANC was pretty confident that it had been robbed of power in its view in both KwaZulu-Natal, the most contested province, and in the Western Cape, which ultimately both were awarded to the opposition and not to the ANC of Mandela. And during the long counting process, the party chiefs of the African National Congress gathered with Mandela at their Johannesburg headquarters. At one point, ANC senior officials demanded of Mandela that the party either call a press conference or denounce the whole election as grand theft. An eyewitness to the meeting was the very well-known American pollster Stanley Greenberg, who was advising the ANC in that election. And he wrote of that meeting at its conclusion the following. Mandela had said nothing during the discussion. Then he brought the room to a full stop. He said, tell the comrades to cancel the press conference. We will not do anything to make this election illegitimate. The ANC will not say the election is not free and fair. Prepare our people in Natal and the Western Cape to lose, unquote. He followed through with this example towards the end of his presidency when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission prepared to publish its interim report in October 1998. Both his predecessor as president, F.W. de Klerk, and his successor as president, Thabo Mbeki, for very different reasons, wanted either to suppress or censor the TRC report of Desmond Tutu. By contrast, Mandela said the equivalent of publish and be damned. And as his authorized biographer, Anthony Sampson wrote of that and other instances of Mandela transcending the narrow diktat of the party line, he said, as head of state, Mandela saw himself as having loyalties which went beyond the ANC. Indeed, as president and even before, Mandela ensured that his presidential office was no echo chamber reserved only for approving voices. He sought the counsel of a range of viewpoints. And while Mandela was indeed unyielding in his bottom lines, he claimed no monopoly of wisdom on key issues. In fact, he used to say, I don't know about this. Tell me about that. Inform me. Let me hear what you have to say. And he sought a range of views and voices beyond the party faithful and his inner circle. Precisely, in my view, that is the reason why someone so outside the confines of his movement, such as myself, enjoyed such access to him. And he mostly seemed to relish an outsider perspective. Unfortunately, in South Africa today, a very different set of attitudes prevails. For while Mandela enjoyed the cut and thrust of parliamentary justs and sought the views of international and local business leaders and spent an enormous amount of his political capital and emotional energy engaging his former enemies, today in South Africa, it is a very different story. A gloomy, but I fear entirely accurate description of what South Africa came to pass after Mandela happened in the year of his passing in 2013. The Financial Mail, a Johannesburg newspaper, wrote in August of that year, rightly or wrongly, the ANC views itself as the bellwether of all opinion. It struggles to bring itself to listen to any institution, organization, or individual outside its own ranks. The most important debates within the ANC happens within the ANC. In the minds of the cadres, many of whom think of themselves as part of a liberation movement and not a political party, outside critiques are almost by definition wrong. It was indeed at the height of misrule of Mandela's successor, one Jacob Zuma, uh, successor but one, here they are pictured together, but even today under the more enlightened leadership 
of Suru and Opposa that we see the triumph of the party over the state and the shutting down of discordant views. In searching for South Africa's democratic renewal, it is worth pausing for a moment to consider an essential difference between the leadership styles today of South Africa, whose president is Cyril Ramaphosa, and the South Africa which Mandela led. I mentioned a moment ago how Mandela was a party loyalist and regarded himself in the arcane quasi-revolutionary language of the party as a disciplined and loyal cadre of the movement. But yet so much of his decision-making, while collective in some ways, was also exemplary when he led from the front. Ramaphosa, by contrast, pictured here in years gone by with Mandela, is a consensus seeker, at least within the fractured cockpit of ANC split-driven politics. Yet he also invokes the Mandela mantra to cover himself. For example, Ramaphosa told Parliament two years ago and to his growing band of detractors who are appalled by the shuttered economy, the 40% plus unemployment rate and the rising levels of discontent in South Africa and accusations that he was facing of inertia and inaction, he said as follows. Like Mandela, achieving consensus, building social compacts is not a sign of weakness. It is the essence of who we are. What he left unsaid in all this, of course, was that at crucial moments in South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy and afterwards, Mandela led from the front and often alone and found consensus afterwards. For example, he started secret negotiations with the National Party government while he was still in prison and didn't have a mandate from his party to do so. When in 1992, he visited DeVos at the World Economic Forum, he decided on the spur of the moment to change the party's economic policy of nationalization without compensation, which has started to rear its head again in the South Africa of Ramaphosa. And indeed, even retaining the dreaded Springbok rugby symbol, more which in the moment, which was seen as something that characterized the old order of party in South Africa, Mandela told the party that they needed to actually be generous with reconciliation. So I think it's very important that Mandela did all those things. However, when Mandela told me at the beginning of our political relationship in 1994 after the election, he said, it's very important, Tony, for the opposition to hold up a mirror to the government and to point out where we did things wrong. That was the benchmark he set. But of course, four years in power had altered Mandela's perspective. And when he addressed the ANC party conference in Mafeking in 1997 in December, he severely criticized the press, the non-governmental organizations, the opposition, including my party and other elements of civil society. He identified them as part of some vast and ill-defined counter-revolutionary movement. Now, however intemperate those remarks, they were certainly a far cry from the poisoned waters, which was soon to separate government and the media and the opposition and civil society, which came to characterize the post-Mandela years. If I was to identify two final characteristics of Mandela's leadership and its legacy to my country and the world, they would be firstly, his ability to transcend division and business and use the power of personal example and not the example of his power to achieve lasting ends. The second is closely allied to the first, and that is respect for the rule of law. I offer this thought as South Africa witnesses, its first ever former president, Jacob Zuma, currently serving jail time for defying the courts of law and holding them in contempt. At one level, this is a triumph for the rule of law, which Mandela championed, and the constitution which he helped to bring about. On the other hand, it is sobering that it was Zuma who enjoyed the support of Mandela and on whose watch he came into political prominence. Yet another paradox and contradiction. But I'd like to emphasize the fealty to law as the most important legacy lesson. In my view, countries can survive bad policies, divisive politics, and even mediocre presidents, provided they maintain respect for and replenish the rule of law. Because without that rule of law, no democratically successful or economically prosperous society has ever endured. Strong institutions, in other words, 
always outlaw strong men. And there are two examples from the Mandela years which prove this. The first is about the power of example, and the second about the law, and they're connected. If any of you have ever watched that marvelous Clint Eastwood movie, Invictus, where Morgan Freeman was the perfectly played Mandela doppelganger, I challenge you to see the difference. And there we have Matt Damon playing our Springbok rugby coach, uh, uh, Captain Francois Pinar. You will know that Mandela reconciled his country in 1994, becoming its chief cheerleader, despite the Springbok rugby symbol, as I mentioned, being seen as something of a metaphor for Afrikaans white supremacy. His role helped secure an epic win in the Rugby World Cup final against the more favoured uh, New Zealand team. And that's why Eastwood made such a fine film about this momentous event. But there's an even more important and less remember story from that era, also concerning rugby. The government which Mandela led was determined that South African rugby, after the World Cup, needed to be transformed and deracialized. And so he appointed a commission of inquiry into its affairs. The rugby boss of the day, Louis Late, himself something of an autocrat and bully, was determined to resist this presidential uh, overreach. And so he took Mandela to court and he subpoenaed this global icon, Nelson Mandela, as a humble witness in a trial trying to overturn a commission of inquiry. Mandela told me at the time, and indeed repeats the press, that his blood boiled at being forced into court, the first president ever obliged to defend an executive decision in such matters. The court, headed by an old order jurist, in fact found against Mandela and in favor of Louis Leight. But the wider point was far more important. The president had upheld judicial processes, even those that went against them. 23 years later, and eight years after Mandela's death, the highest court in the land sentenced Jacob Zuma to imprisonment for defying a subpoena to testify before a commission weighing far more important matters than rugby, namely the capture of the state by the corrupt misrule of the same defendant, Jacob Zuma. When the Constitutional Court ruled against Zuma, it appropriately invoked the words of Mandela, an extract from a speech which he delivered when he opened the 1995 Constitutional Court, itself a monument to the rule of law and not the rule of men. Mandela said then, and the court repeated this in its judgment against Zuma, the courts will be tested by direct assaults and also by insidious corrosion, the highest and the humble all, without exception, owe allegiance to the same document, the same principles, and the court will have the lofty but lonely task to ensure that they do. How very appropriate in my view that these fine words from the most law-respecting president would be used against his most legally delinquent successor. I saw Mandela a few times after he retired and we chatted about the country and the world, American presidents and my and his own tense relationship with his successor, Thabo Mbeki, and even the said Zuma, about whom, interestingly, Mandela had some things to, of admiration to say. But in his retirement, he also witnessed the decline of South Africa, when it stood so high on the indices and global tables which matter in the world. Global events, obviously, are often outside the control of government, from coronavirus to commodity prices. But a lot of the dissent after Mandela was a consequence of poor and corrupt leadership and lastly, weak and indecisive decision making. There are many examples, but on the tables that matter in the world, we have definitely gone down. When Mandela left office, the rand dollar exchange was in the six rand range, often referred to a country's uh, exchange price or, or sovereign price is seen as its sovereign share price. Today, it's down to 14 rand to the dollar. And then perhaps more tellingly on the transparency index international index of corruptions of perception, South Africa, when Mandela left office, was a respectable, if not stellar, 34th, and today we are 69th. De Klerk and Mandela were jointly in 1993 awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. But however, it was another South African Nobel laureate, who was J.M. Kutsia, who uh, said of Mandela's leadership at the time of his death, 
He was, and by the time of his death, was universally held to be a great man. He may be well the last of the great men, as the concept of greatness retires into the historical shadows. Now, I mentioned this quote of J.M. Kutsia about Nelson Mandela, because as you'll be aware, just a month ago in South Africa, mobs looted major shopping centers across Durban and Johannesburg, shortly after Jacob Zuma received the sentence I referenced just a moment ago. And it was described by Ramaphosa as one of the worst moments and scenes in democratic South Africa. And yet Ramaphosa's response to that was very half-baked. He both gave a rather, I thought, weak response. And on the other hand, under his watch, and certainly under Zuma's watch, the entire state security apparatus had been hollowed out. And the state agencies that should have interdicted the violence and indeed addressed the cause of it were largely missing in action. As with so many terrible moments in South Africa's recent history, I contemplated how Mandela would have responded to it. And my likely view, or my view of his likely action, would have been from the front. He would have been unequivocal. He would have been the first out of the blocks. And it wasn't just that I'm anticipating what he might have done, it's what he actually did do. You see, in the hinge of history moment when violence wrecked South Africa was in 1993, when one of the great ANC leaders, Chris Harney, who I was also got to know during those constitutional negotiations, was assassinated by a Polish immigrant and extreme uh, anti-communist right winger and an accomplice from the Conservative Party. And this was a terrible moment for the country. It plunged the country into racial riots, insurrection, deep fear. President F.W. de Klerk, the president of the day, was on holiday. And it fell to Mandela, who wasn't even the president, to go before the nation on television and try and calm the waters and make sense of it all. Mandela, with his almost genius-like emotional intelligence, managed to diffuse the ticking time bomb which Harney's assassination had unleashed or put, into, into, uh, in, in, uh, put under stress by saying the following to the country. A white man, full of prejudice and hate, came to our country and committed a deed so foul that our nation teeters on the brink of disaster. And yet, Mandela added, a white woman, it was indeed, let me add, a white woman, Margarita Haramsa, had given the details of the assassins to the police. A white woman of Afrikaner origin risked her life so that we may know and bring to justice this assassin. And so it went with Mandela. He not only had a firm view of law and order, he had an even firmer view on reconciliation and appropriate responses. So I think the one lesson to draw from all this is that Mandela was in so many ways a nation's once in a lifetime offer. And we will unlikely see his time any again, anytime again soon, here or anywhere. However, it was perhaps appropriately at Mandela's funeral service, memorial service in Soweto, where in December 2013, 90,000 people, including 90 world leaders and millions watching on TV, watched the most powerful man in South Africa at the time, President Jacob Zuma, being booed and catcalled by a large section of the crowd, even though Zuma was at the height of his power and prestige, but he defiled his office through various acts of corruption already then known. And so this catcalling and booing at Mandela's funeral was perhaps testament to the fact that people did not fear to express themselves even against the good and the great. And it was followed the following year when Zuma's party lost power in every major city in South Africa except one. And a few years after that, Zuma could not get his appointed successor chosen as party leader, and he was bundled out of office ceremoniously before his term ended. There was something of the democratic renewal in all this that I think owed a lot to the example paved by Mandela and the pushback by civil society against abuses of, of office and betrayers of the public trust and the public burst. I think uh, it's perhaps worth ending, especially as I'm speaking to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, to recall the words of another democratic icon and freedom fighter, just four years before Mandela emerged to change his country and perhaps the world, 
Another famous political prisoner was released from jail in the Soviet Union, the first to be freed by Mikhail Gorbachev. Nathan Sharansky had also been convicted and imprisoned for high treason. And after nine years in jail, and after his release, he emigrated to Israel and a career in politics there. His post-prison career was not as successful as Mandela's, but his powerful polemic, which he wrote in 2004, contains the seed of an essential truth and one that Mandela and his South Africa helped birth. In the case for democracy, Saransky elaborates with passion and clarity on the idea that freedom is rooted in the right to dissent, to walk into the town square and declare one's view without fear of consequence. Exactly what a section of the vast audience did at Mandela's memorial service. Yet in the challenges and the crises facing South Africa today, the question arises, can we renew ourselves? It's improbable, but it's certainly not impossible. For the many things which have gone right and wrong with South Africa since our first steps under Mandela's leadership towards becoming a free society in 1994, Sharansky's universal observation that the democracy, which sometimes dis dislikes us, is a much safer place than the dictatorship which loves us, must serve as both a guide and inspiration for South Africa to use an American Americanism to build back better. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, a great presentation. Uh, whenever you get it, whenever you uh, exit the share screen, we have a couple minutes. We can do a quick audience Q and A. Sure. So Thanks. for those who are still viewing, if you have any questions, please submit them to the Q and A. Um, let's get into the first question. What could have Mandela done to give the new democracy a better chance of lasting success? Or is it so much of what he could have done or what just in general may have went wrong or just got away from? Yeah, I, I've thought about that a great deal. It's a great question. Because the, the issue really is, you know, could we have had a better constitution? Could we have uh, perhaps put in more checks and balances against what bad leads have followed? And, you know, I'm not sure that we could have. I also think you have to realize that Mandela wasn't a sort of, you know, patron saint. He was a practicing politician. There was a divided country. And I suspect he did the best he could uh, under the circumstances, better than might have been expected. You know, I, I, I was when I before I went to politics, I was a constitutional law lecturer at Wits University. And I used to quote to my students was back in the 1980s, the words of the very famous American judge Learned Hand. Learned Hand said, you know, basically, uh, no, uh, we often put too much faith, I'm paraphrasing, in constitutions, rules, of, rule of law and uh, bills of rights. Uh, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. And when it dies there, no constitution, no court of law, and no bill of rights can save it. So I guess, you know, Mandela could give an example, but it's up to the country to make the best of the example and to follow or not follow that particular example. And I guess we've, in some ways, let him down or not followed the example. In other ways, we have. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if he were here today, what do you think would be different? Like, where... where what, what work would be done? Like, where would he begin? Well, I think it's an interesting question. Obviously, one can speculate. Uh, look, uh, Mandela, as I said in the lecture, Rahim, was not a saint. He was a party animal. He, he believed in the party. He did uh, not always uh, take action against uh, officials who were corrupt, but the whole level of corruption was far less on Mandela's watch. So, so that was one big difference. The other thing was that Mandela was, uh, I think, less involved in the day-to-day nitty-gritty of government because he was much more involved in the more important symbolic mass of reconciliation. But I think his instincts were firmer. So, for example, in our quote what Graham Post said, there is no way in the recent looting and rioting that I think a lot of you folks saw on your television screens last month coming out of South Africa, that Mandela would have made the kind of rather feeble speech that Graham Post did, he would have said, as he said in Parliament in my presence in 995, this is unacceptable. We are not bowing down before anarchy. We are going to hit back very hard. Now, I mean, 
to the extent that Ramposa said that, which he sort of did in a half-hearted way, he, he so disabled the state or his government had that they couldn't really strike back. And there are some terrible issues of inequality and poverty in South Africa. So you'll be familiar with those because they're not unique to South Africa. And I think the other criticism was, you know, did Mandela do enough to start addressing those issues uh, during his presidency? Well, the answer is no, but he was busy with so many other tasks that, you know, you couldn't really expect him to do everything simultaneously. And the one thing, and perhaps it's an obvious point that your other participants have made, is I talked about the power of Mandela's example, the key lesson left South Africa, particularly in a region and a continent which has so many strong men who overstayed their welcome, abused their power, is Mandela was the most popular president we've ever had. That's incontestable. He only served one term. He, he constitution could have served two. Now the others, you know, have all tried to elbow their way to more power or be the party president, even though the country isn't. Mandela walked away after one term because he wanted to show that uh, the country was not dependent on one person. And that, that was, to me, a great example. And so we can be very critical and perhaps correctly critical about absences or misses or lost opportunities, but you can only do so much in one political life. And he did it great. Absolutely. And you know, we have a few minutes left. I want to leave it off with, could you share with us one of your one or some of your favorite stories you had with Mandela? Well, apart from the ones I've told you now, um, <laughs> I, I I think the, uh, the 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 best story about Mandela that you know I, I was uh, party to or, or involved with was when he used to come up at these political events. Well, in, in my case, and I, I mentioned my wife, Hachal, but she helped with the tech, <laughs> and we were at a dinner. We were at a a dinner for, uh, I think, Jerry Rawlings, the president of Ghana. She was just then my sort of girlfriend. We were partners, but she wasn't, we weren't yet married. And Mandela asked us, it was very typical, he sent some official to come to our table. You know, he was the main table, I was some less table, about 200 people at this dinner. And so the, the, his bodyguard, security guard said, the president wants to see you, both of you, point to my girlfriend, now wife. And so Michal had, and Mandela didn't meet Machal because she didn't Israel, she was visiting South Africa, but he read about her, heard about her. And, and he turned around to uh, Machal, whom he just met, and you know, she was transfixed by this global icon, you know, being so nice to her. And he said, when are you going to say yes to this young man? I didn't even ask her to marry him. <laughs> so in a way, to use, to use the phrase that some Jewish listeners would be, he was a sort of shatchan unintended of our marriage. I mean, you know, he was the one who said, well, when are you going to do it? And we did it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And before we go, could you share with us how we can uh, support and follow your work going forward after this program? And if you have anything coming up you would like to share with us as well? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very involved, obviously, in various activities in South Africa. The one that I am involved in, which is, you know, we, we've been absolutely devastated by this COVID coronavirus, um, as you have been, but in South Africa, and, and a lot of the great events of, of, of our recent cultural calendar have fallen by the wayside, and, and a lot of us are involved in trying to revive. We're involved in a particular exercise, my wife and I, called the Friendship Literary Festival, which only provides you know, great literary, literary opportunities to uh, a range of people to come and listen, but we support a lot of literacy and uh, libraries in, in a fairly impoverished area around what is a very wealthy area. So we're busy with that. And in fact, there's a program coming on when I'm talking to the uh, world acclaimed historian, Neil Ferguson, later this month, who's just written a new book called Doom. So um, if people would you know, like to become friends of the Front of Literary Festival, that would be very helpful because uh, it just really cost a few pennies that you participate not just in great literary events, but you, you're helping communities to kind of reestablish themselves through books and learnings in very impoverished areas. So that's one thing. There's another great South African initiative, which I'm not directly involved in, called Africa Tikkun, which, uh, you know, from the great... Uh, 
Talmudic idea of repairing the breach, which does enormous work in South Africa across communities. And, and that's a great organization support as well, I think. And yeah, so there's so many, it's a lot of need. There are a lot of very good people. I, I mentioned Rahim in my talk that, you know, the, the great lesson of South Africa, the best uh, example of its possible renewal is the fact it has a very strong civil society and there are myriad organizations there that do good and great work to move the country forward and all its people. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your time today. And for everyone that's still online, please take a moment to fill out our survey. Also a link to our upcoming programs should be in the chat as well. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next program. Thanks you, thank you again, Tony. Thank you, Rahim, appreciate it. Goodbye. Right, have, have a great evening. Thank you.